Welcome learning and talent development partners and colleagues. My name is John Aquilino and I'm the Senior Manager for Strategic Accounts with DeVry University. Today, now more than ever before, we're all faced with both personal and professional issues as a direct result of the COVID-19 pandemic. One of the key areas that talent practitioners like us face is what is learning and development going to look like in the new normal? I'm joined today by four outstanding panelists that are gonna give us an insider's look to their organization and to help understand some of the real-time challenges that they're faced with, and best yet, some of the practices that they've been able to implement. So without any further ado, please help me join Amanda Steubenrock, who is the Vice President for Organization and Talent Development for Dover Corporation. Dover Corporation is a global manufacturer that delivers innovative equipment and components, consumable supplies, aftermarket parts, software and digital solutions, as well as support services. We also are joined by Lori Burns. Lori is the National Vice President of Learning for Global Medical Response. Global Medical Response delivers compassionate, quality medical care, primarily, primarily in the areas of emergency and patient relocation services around the world. We're also joined by Monica Guillory. Monica is the Senior Director of Human Resources and Workplace Inclusion for RR Donnelly. RR Donnelly is a global leader of multi-channel business communication services and marketing solutions for more than 155 years. And finally, Pete Martinez. Pete is the Vice President of Talent Management for the ADECO Group. The ADECO Group is the nation's leading provider for temporary, temp to hire, and contingency search and placement services. So welcome to Amanda, Lori, Monica, and Pete. So let's dive right in. Pete, I've been wondering, how has the impact of COVID-19 adjusted your approach to attracting, engaging, and retaining your workforce within the ADECO group? Sure. So, you know, attraction ha um, has um, kind of traditionally been all about that in-person experience, you know, meeting somebody over coffee, uh, joining them at a networking event or just in general going out in the public and, and meeting uh, talent. Uh, that has all changed. You know, uh, now we're more uh, geared towards that virtual experience using some of the basic tools <clears throat> available to all. You know, uh, WhatsApp, uh, using the tools available through FaceTime. Um, any, any of those tools that are readily available to our talent and to our audience, that's what we're focusing on. Not, not the traditional tools that, that make it hard for all to use but those easy to use that everybody's been using for a while. For us, engagement uh, has always been a focus, you know, making sure that our, our talent knows what, uh, how we feel about them, how we appreciate their work. And so for us, um, we've always been focused on the proper uh, techniques, the proper uh, tools to use to ensure that we have our, our talent engaged and, and recognized. You know, it's important to ensure that our, our teams appreciate, know that we appreciate them, uh, especially in times like this. Um, you know, our meetings now are a little different. They're not the usual stuffy uh, office meetings. A little more relaxed. We, uh, we, we don't really focus on the attire. You know, we have, a, we have fun, everybody being relaxed and comfortable at home. We also don't get discouraged with the interruptions throughout the workday. We actually encourage uh, bringing in those family members that accidentally walk into a meeting uh, and, and, and making them part of the conversation because you know, at the end of the day, we're all going through this, we're all going through a tough time and any chance we get to decrease our uh, colleague stress levels, to engage even their family members and then make this a real team atmosphere. We're all in it together, making sure that we're all able to support each other when needed. Um, Overall, uh, we're all in this together. The, work, the work's gonna get done. We're not as focused on the work as we once were. We're more focused on our uh, well-being, our, our people's uh, mental health and their happiness. Well, Pete, I appreciate that very much. And talking about decrease in stress levels, I mean, now more than ever, 
a decrease in stress level, both professionally and personally, I mean, it has to happen, right? I mean, there's only so much that we can all kind of deal with. So it's amazing perspective and thanks. Uh, Lori, um, what are some of your thoughts on the topic? Oh, thanks, John. You know, I would agree 100% with Pete. You know, we have a, a developed a new department called um, GMR Life, and that really is focusing on the well-being of our current providers, um, being frontline to the epidemic. We uh, deployed to uh, New York and New Jersey. We do have the FEMA contract for medical transportation. So we're really focusing on retention. Uh, recruitment phase is a little unique now in the fact that across all healthcare organizations, we've really seen a downturn in our volume um, because folks aren't going out and about. There's no trauma because there's not as many people doing adventurous things or out on the road. So we have, um, uh, we don't have a significant need uh, right now to, um, to recruit uh, as we have a hiring freeze on because uh, we can maintain with our current staffing numbers. Uh, but we really do want to focus on those folks who are uh, out there risking their lives every day, taking care of those folks being affected um, by this emerging uh, infectious disease. Uh, I think the greatest concern is moving forward. Is this going to impact our ability uh, to draw interest into the profession? It often, an epidemic like this causes people to pause and think, "Do I, is this an industry I can go into? Healthcare, um, you know, this is just one of the many risks we have when we're uh, caring for patients. So I think uh, we have to look at uh, what our pipeline is going forward. We've been impacted by not having the clinical and field internship sites that we need to have those currently in programs complete the programs. So those are the challenges we're faced with, um, but we really do wanna focus on retaining and supporting those folks who are currently in our workforce. Excellent, thank you for sharing. Um, obviously, organizations that are right there on the front lines as as is uh, global uh, uh, global medical responses is um, uh, opening up a lot of opportunity, but also having to have you think about unique and creative ways to keep that pipeline moving forward. So um, that's to you, Lori, and thanks for your uh, information. So let's switch over to Amanda. Uh, Amanda, what are some of your perspectives on the uh, attraction, engagement, and uh, retention of workforce post COVID nineteen? Thanks, John. Um, so first, I would say a lot of the comments that both Pete and Lori made I uh, resonate with me because, um, like I think most other companies, the kind of the safety, the health, the well-being, and the balance of is most important right now. Um, but one of the things that we've really stopped to take a pause and think about as an organization is, you know, how do we maybe take advantage of this opportunity to think about our brand in the marketplace. Um, and what is the employee value proposition for a career at Dover? Um, being in a large global industrial or manufacturing organization, we're, we're not typically known for being, um, you know, the warm and fuzzy um, type of environment. Um, Dover is actually, I think, fairly unique in the sense that um, when we talk with our employees, one of the things that really keeps people at Dover for, for a long time in their career is the people. Uh, we have you know, tremendous people at Dover, um, just really strong values, um, very encouraging of one another. And so we've, you know, we've really stopped to think, how can we take advantage of that and maybe try to showcase that a bit and set ourselves apart as an organization? Um, some of the things that uh, we've really been uh, thinking about when it comes to how we attract talent, um, like many others have said, um, our, I would say our hiring is a bit lower right now but we're certainly trying to be a little bit more innovative in our approach uh, because we can't have that high touch right now as Pete talked about. So uh, making videos of teens, um, trying to kind of be, um, I would say more innovative um, and interesting, um, actually doing some kind of walk arounds in the uh, work environment, um, having the hiring manager speak directly to potential candidates. So actually doing some, you know, as much as we can kind of high touch, but virtual with what, what a career at Dover and what the job specifically is calling for. Um, the other thing that I would say, just in terms of retention is we're really encouraging our leaders right now to do everything they can to stay closely connected with their employees. Um, and, you know, for each team that may look a little bit differently. I know, for example, I hold kind of a virtual happy hour. Um, beverage of your choice um, uh, every single Wednesday afternoon with my team just to keep us connected. 
Uh, we focus on how everyone's doing personally. Um, you know, one of the standing rules is we're not going to talk action items and run through task lists. So it's how's everyone doing? How's your family? Uh, do you need anything more or less of for me right now? What kind of communication would you like to see more of from the leaders? Um, and we're really encouraging um, just by way of having kind of a almost a suite of options that we can provide to leaders who are maybe a little bit less comfortable um, operating this environment, how they can stay connected. So I think for us, innovation um, in the way that we approach talent and in the way that we stay connected with our current employees uh, has become even more important than it has in the past and just really being creative. Pushing, our, pushing ourselves outside of our comfort zone just a little bit to make sure that we have as, as close of what we would call kind of the virtual high touch as we possibly can. Um, and I would say just kind of closing with, um, we're trying to constantly remind our employees that um, as our most critical asset to the organization, um, our talent, they are most important to us. And so as much as we want them um, you know, to kind of certainly be productive and engaged, it's also about staying safe, staying healthy, and I, uh, I personally end most of my meetings now with stay safe, healthy, and productive, and um, I know my team uh, definitely gets a kick out of that. I'm sure there's a t-shirt in my future somewhere with that tagline on there, um, but that's th those are just some of the things that I would say uh, Dover's trying to do at this time. Thanks, John. Oh, you're welcome, Amanda. Thank you so much for all that. You know, what I'm hearing is a trend of uh, bringing things down to the person, bringing things down to... Um, virtual, albeit virtual, but active engagement. And I know as an organization, we too at DeVry, same thing. We're, uh, we're taking a look at the person, right? And seeing where it goes from there. So thank you so much for this. Um, I am actually not sure if anybody else did, but uh, I'm hoping that we're gonna get an invite to that virtual happy hour, Amanda, at some point. <laughs> you know? Yeah, we'll have to extend that out. They actually picked up some membership along the way, not a surprise. <laughs> I'm sure you did. I'm sure you did. So that's fun. That's exciting. So let's shift into our second question here. Um, what are the most crucial workforce development areas that you yourself see aligning focus towards over the next three months? So short term and then possibly a little bit longer and by longer, maybe around six months. Monica, you've been quiet so far, so let's hear from you a little bit. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Hello, everyone. Um, near term, you know, there's um, obviously one thing everyone has in common, and that is uncertainty. So in the near term, short term, we certainly have um, shifted on how we do every single thing um, within the organization. So before checking on the productivity of any project or any work, it's check on the person uh, and some of, of the panelists have, um, you know, said similar things in their organization. I personally, as a leader, but, but all of the leaders um, in, in the organization have, have been coached and asked and supported um, in, in trying to uh, demonstrate more empathy, um, instill greater trust, especially um, in a backdrop of, of so much uncertainty and, and change. Um, that is uh, in the near term, but of course, we're still servicing clients as well as taking care of employees. Um, but we know that we still take care of our clients' needs to the extent we take care of our employees' needs. And so, um, in, in the short term, that's a lot more um, touch points, as, as people have said. Um, while we love all of the technology that has come about, and we have many virtual meetings like we're doing now. Um, there's also some some burnout and fatigue that can be associated with uh, the Hollywood Square boxes and the, the that we're all in. Um, and so we are um, having the flexibility and the agility to strike the right tone. Um, and so you have to learn how to practice inclusion. And inclusion is about, um, you know, not just treating people the way I want to be treated, but learning to treat them the way they need to be treated at this time. And so we ask more questions. I mean, the, the leadership model um, has all of a sudden been broken. We got to refigure it out. Um, and so it's the same set of skills, but some things move up in priority, like, like empathy, engagement, communication, over communicating is something in the short term next three months, we absolutely must do. And we're finding blended ways to do that, whether it's personal call outs, um, virtual calls, live streams, 
um, messages with our CEO has been wonderful. Um, we are having new teams form intentionally across the company in a way that we never have. One, all of a sudden, all of the um, digital revolution digital revolution plans we had for the organization for the workforce that were multi months long come to fruition within weeks, literally. So now everybody, most of the workforce, 43,000 employees, we have people in plants, absolutely, but we have a whole lot of people that are at home now working um, remotely. And so the, the workforce has changed and how we connect has to change. So skills like agility now move to the forefront, um, strategic planning to the forefront. We always have strategies, but it's a different process now. We're planning, you know, the way that we budget forecast is, is so different um, than what we started out 2020 as. So we have to revisit that and the decision makers have to bring the whole organization along as we do it. And so how do we, in this virtual world, have real relationships and connectivity and organizational cadence throughout the organization so that we're moving in the same direction. And so there's a lot to pay attention to um, and, and a lot to get done. But it's, as, as much as we've been impacted, um, like all industries by COVID, there are new revenue streams and opportunities coming and we gotta shift um, our skills and capabilities to, to service clients in this, this new way. And so, um, you know, when you say three months, six months, 12 months, you know, priority every day, day one, hour to hour is take care of our people, check in with them. Um, that is a priority and that is from the very top to all levels. Um, but the second is we really need leadership from every seat. We need more collaboration. Um, you got a good idea. We need you to raise it. And that's why we also um, have to create um, new platforms for idea sharing. So how do people do it? They can't just walk in the office. Meetings aren't exactly the same. And when we're meeting, how do we get everyone's voice heard in those meetings? And so those are, are, are shifts that we're making in our just our day-to-day, week-to-week working protocol and how we measure results, how we deliver solutions, uh, and how we train in the new skills um, to keep us viable and relevant, keep our people employed uh, and healthy at the same time. Invigorating, Monica, thank you so much. Some of the things I've heard in that conversation were, check with the person first, right? The person is the top, right? First and foremost, how are they doing? Where are they going? Um, new style of leadership coming on board quickly um, and having agility and having the ability to be able to to adjust quickly. You know, it's funny, you also mentioned something about um, previous timelines to get things accomplished. I mean, basically being thrown out the window right now. The window. Those timelines, that right? <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. So thank you, Monica. Pete, um, what say you on the topic? Yeah, similar to Monica, we, you know, the timelines have, have shrunk or gone away, right? Miraculously overnight, our IT departments are able to do magic. Uh, but I think it's been obviously the need, um, you know, the needs of the business to stay in, uh, ahead of the curve in, in the 21st century, the need to be in the 21st century in the first place for some, some cases. Uh, I think from an L&D perspective, uh, a lot of our programs um, tend to think they have to rely on that in-person touch as well. So how do we convert some of those in-person programs into, into these virtual programs now? that require uh, that uh, virtual technology or that technology being used. Um, so, you know, we've also made a shift in the business. You know, we, we originally, so in the next three months, we were originally thinking, how do we get back into the buildings? How do we get back to our old ways of doing business, old ways of uh, learning and development? And now it's more of what does our new strategy look like, right? Because based on all the local, state, federal requirements, um, it's not as easy to get back in the building, to get back into the old ways of doing things. Um, and if we do get back into the buildings, it won't be the same way. We, we're going to have to maintain distances. We're going to have to change the way we do business. Mm -hmm. So 
But how do we use that technology to help us? You know, so a lot of the thinking that we're doing right now is <clears throat> what are the skill sets our people need? Uh, not just immediately, but really long term, because I think this is going to be the shift. You know, uh, we are a sales organization, so we're heavily focused in that in person experience. It's really important. So what does that in person experience look like now virtually? You know, the days of, again, being in the office with your client. Having the luxury of uh, reading the room, having the luxury of seeing everybody in the room and their body language uh, to gauge where you're at in that conversation. No longer available, right? Now you're kind of focused on just what's in the screen. So what are those skills? What are those techniques? What are the things to hear for? What are those clues? What other senses do we not need to rely on when it comes to that? So we're, we're really focusing on that right now, obviously, because as a business, it's uh, it's important for us to kind of grow immediately right after we we return to some level of normalcy, but also to develop those skills moving forward because it, it takes time. Uh, the, the other thing that we're looking at is the the leadership development, the soft skills. To, to Monica's point, really, the those are those are skills we always struggle with, anyways. So how do we ensure that our leaders are putting our people at the very top, like you said, John? Uh, starting with that person first, because that's the, the real focus here. But focusing on all those skills and not so much uh, some of the other traditional leadership skills that we always focus on, um, it's it's real key right now. So in general, just kind of looking at both the technical training that's needed in the next three to six months because of what we anticipate the business to change to, but also those uh, leadership soft skills that we need to develop uh, as we continue to move forward uh, to, to help us kind of continue to grow and build on the culture that we'll need to maintain if we're going to be successful moving forward. You're in, you're in similar, similar, similar veins. Uh -huh. Yeah. Culture and it starts with the people and the engagement of and getting them ready to take on the new tasks that are going to be faced in normal. So thank you, Pete. I'm seeing a lot of similarity here. So Amanda, from your perspective, um, what would you add? Yeah, so again, a lot of, uh, I would say similar, similar themes. So um, really listening to Monica and Pete talk about how critical it is that we push things forward quicker. <laughs> uh, just from a sports planning perspective, I would say that's a, that's a clear one that we've seen play out across all of our functions. Um, one of the things I would say from just a workforce planning perspective, um, Dover has a core competency model that um, we really try to ground all of our people practices in. And one of the things that we have definitely seen play out amidst uh, kind of you know, this pandemic is, you know, as we look at how we plan for our workforce, we take a look at some of the, the key competencies that we think are going to be needed, you know, kind of short term, medium and long term. And what I would say is um, just from a leadership and managerial perspective, you know, traditionally, um, some of the competencies that would really rise to the top around, you know, driving for results and technical competencies and things like that, those are always important, but they've become a little bit more, I would say, just sort of price of admission. And what we're really looking at now is, you know, being able to, um, you know, develop in our leaders and, you know, attract and retain leaders that can really be good ambassadors for spotting strong talent, developing talent. Uh, retaining top talent in their organization. Um, agility has become, I would say, our number one competency right now. Um, mm -hmm. seeing that leaders across our organization, when they demonstrate that they have the agility to just kind of flex and uh, more quickly shift to the, you know, just how quickly times are changing. Um, we've seen some leaders really rise to the top uh, during times like this. Um, I, I would say the other thing that has really become front and center for us is just the concept of having really everyday succession be a part of um, what our leaders are thinking and talking about. So, you know, at Dover, we have an annual succession process and talent review process, much like, you know, I would say most other organizations probably do. Um, we have really started to take a look at embedding our succession planning practices. Um, having emergency succession plans for cases like this, mm -hmm. and just really mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, what does the future of the organization need to look like? Has this really changed our thinking from what we would have said a year ago? Is it going to be really critical in some of these roles? And in many cases, it has. 
um, or at a minimum, you know, the competencies that we want to see for leaders who could be ready now for our key positions, those competencies are just what that map looks like is changing just a little bit. So um, I would say that, you know, it's really being mindful of how has the, um, you know, I would say just kind of the diagram of what your ideal leader looks like in this state. How has that changed? Um, you know, from a from a sheer numbers perspective, um, to Monica's point about how we're forecasting budget and even just workforce needs, um, I would say we're doing that much more frequently. Um, it changes sometimes by the week um, when we're looking at even just forecasting hiring needs in certain areas of the globe right now. Um, and so, you know, having to again just be agile, be nimble, um, definitely something that we're really pushing with our employees. So. Our processes have changed a little bit, but I would say more than that, what, what has really changed is maybe the, the order of importance of some of the, the leadership competencies mm -hmm. that we're looking at mm -hmm. and how those, you know, kind of play into all the different mm -hmm. people practices from hiring um, to engaging to retaining just across the board. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, Amanda, I thank you very much for that. You know, one of the key takeaways, I think, this whole panel can can um, draw from that is the piece about everyday secession plans. Um, having to reevaluate on a much more regular basis because we don't know what the future is going to hold, right? So I think we all just become a little bit more hypersensitive to that now, going through what we've gone through for the last sixty days, um, making adjustments, um, being more nimble, um, and the A word keeps presenting itself is agility, right? Agility, speed, efficiency um, across the board. So Amanda, thank you for sharing so much. So the third question that we wanted to try and ask all of our panelists um, are, because we have individuals that are specifically focused in learning and development, um, as well as all aspects of talent management, but from a learning and development perspectives, what modifications do you all think um, both formal and informal learning are going to start surfacing as a direct result of the situation that we're all going through right now. So, Lori, from your perspective, um, would you take us away with this? Sure. Thanks, John. So, one of the first things we did, because we're 38,000 employees across all 50 states, we have to have one single source of truth. So, it really uh, developed a uh, we put on our portal for our internal employees, but also for our community partners, um, information they need just in time. All the changes as we're seeing the evolution of COVID-19 come out, changes in disinfection, dis how to um, appropriately attain and uh, don and off uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, we uh, really did uh, have to uh, increase the number of nurse navigators we have. We have a nurse navigation line that addresses employees' concerns or issues should they have an exposure or a potential concern that they had an exposure to COVID-19. So all those things are on one site. So rather than individual departments mm -hmm. creating their own um, guidelines and protocols and policies, we want to be sure that everyone's focused on the same place. So anything that went out via a memo or a new protocol, whether it's a safety protocol or a clinical based one, it all went to one location on the portal on the website uh, that they could reference. So that was really helpful. Um, and I think it uh, created less concern for folks of, we don't know what to do in this because we had our thought leaders within the organization developing those and distributing those. So that's um, that's been very helpful as an organization to st stay cohesive um, in the formal components that we needed to have uh, to keep our healthcare providers safe and to also do the best by our patients. Uh, so that was one of the first things um, sort of in that sort of formal and informal. And then the other thing we had to do is change our onboarding process. So we certainly have people in the pipeline to uh, mm -hmm. have offers in place. Uh, we can't bring great numbers of people into a classroom to do that in-person delivery of um, of the educational component that was traditionally, you know, the meet and greet, get to know your peers, bring them together as a cohort to move forward mm -hmm. um, joining the organization. So I developed a task force of leaders that are uh, typically doing that onboarding for both our air organizations and our ground uh, side 
to develop how do we do this virtually again as everybody on the panel reference we want that high touch we want from the moment that people walk in the door to know how important they are to us and so we had to be able to convey that in a virtual platform so creating that task force of again those experts who do it every day how do we move this into um, to a different world and that being virtual and then the, a lot of um, the responsibilities then uh, fell on different people I think again as we heard reference uh, there's others who weren't necessarily formal leaders had become leaders because they took on that responsibility of a new hire in a different way um, we have field training officers and preceptors who are tasked with that job of onboarding but it's after what we call an academy and there's a little more uh, formal uh, component to that before they're handed off to those folks who are doing the patient care. So those individuals really had to step up um, and fill the gap where there might have uh, been some learning concerns or identifying and doing assessments that they didn't have to do previously. So, uh, so this movement to virtual uh, has been challenging. We have a very traditional workforce who likes to be in the classroom. They like to uh, see their peers that they may not see, but that once a month when there's an education or once a quarter when there's an educational opportunity. So again, everybody moved into virtual platforms. We have primary education campuses around the country as well. Um, they moved quickly um, and I think adopted a little more um, easily to the virtual component um, uh, than our continuing ed uh, current providers did. Because again, it's just new, it's different. It's, what we're, it's not what they were accustomed to do. We, uh, of course, in healthcare have licensures and certifications that need to be maintained uh, for us to be able to care for our folks and be sure that everyone, uh, the public has faith that uh, we have the oversight and the gold standard expected. So we had to work with those government entities and those organizations uh, that are the authorities over those licensures and certification and fortunate enough to get those extended uh, because uh, they recognize the concern for all the healthcare providers needing to have time to be with patients and we can't have that in-person uh, quality education that we might have uh, typically had for those renewal processes for licensure and certification. So, that was a big step that we had to take on very early on is to work with the credentialing and licensure bodies to be sure that we could keep people on uh, on the job, even though they had gaps. So they graciously mm -hmm. extended in many of um, uh, most states and uh, again, the credentialing bodies extended uh, at least 120 days on their certification so that they could continue to practice without having to pull people from the workforce because of that. Uh, ability to do what we would typically do for a renewal process. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lori. You know, what I'm hearing is, is that organizations that support us all, as we see in, in pretty much every mainstream environment right now, uh, organizations are making adjustments, right? They're making adjustments to the certification and the recertification hours that are needed, uh, giving a little bit longer time. Organizations are being very adaptive to change traditional learning experiences into virtual experiences, onboarding of new individuals, um, you know, but it's also forcing the service providers to make sure that we're looking at different, unique and cool and creative ways to try and meet their needs, right? Because we may not have walked into this year thinking we needed to do that, but you know, here, now here we are. So we also agile and nimble. So thank you. Amanda, would love your perspectives on the topics. Yeah, sure. So uh, again, just so many relevant um, comments that Lori made that I can, you know, just they just really do resonate with me. Um, one of the things I think when I think about our formal learning, I'll start with that. Um, at Dover, we've got a um, kind of a, a suite of uh, developmental programs that are available for our employees. Um, our LEAP curriculum is one of them. And traditionally, these are programs that you know, one of the main benefits, right, is that we get to bring employees from across the globe and many different business units together um, in person to experience that learning. And when I look at some of the, the feedback surveys, you know, they, they talk frequently about how that's one of the biggest benefits. Well, at this point in time, um, no one can really travel. And, and I would say in particular global travel and what that looks like in the future, um, I think is, is still to be determined uh, by the world at this point. So, what we've had to really quickly do is shift and really flip that whole curriculum upside down and figure out how we can 
implement um, most of those courses and offering virtually without losing the benefit of bringing all of that different thinking and that diversity together, um, actually physically. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had to do that really quickly, um, everything from content to delivery. Um, and so, you know, we, you know, we're lucky enough to have some, some great systems, such as our learning management system and some virtual platforms that we, we typically have used for more of like our compliance based training and things like that. But really trying to find some more innovative platforms and working with many of our partners, um, certainly deriving one of them to to push some learning out in different in different ways. Um, and as we're doing that, one of the other things that we've really had to think about is some of the day-to-day -day training that many of our employees are used to getting out on the production floor in the plants may need to also look differently now. And so, whereas some of our learning in the past that has been more developmental has really been geared more towards, I would say, roles that are in more of that kind of professional office environment, we now have learners that are used to being out on our plant floors, out, you know, out in the production environment that are having to learn in different ways. And so, how do we also tailor some of that virtual learning um, to different types of learners, many of whom would much more prefer that hands-on kind of tactile learning, mm -hmm. um, a lot of that job knowledge transfer and retention that they would get together, literally kind of standing across bins of parts. So how do we do this differently for them from an onboarding perspective? So all of our, I would say the way that we teach and develop and coach mm -hmm. everything from technical skills to just leadership skills, um, we're having to flip pretty quickly. And at this point, what we're doing for the remainder of 2020 is planning that that curriculum is likely going to be maintained virtually for the remainder of the year. Um, just knowing that, you know, even as different countries and states may lift shelter orders, um, you know, we don't want our employees to feel they have to put themselves in any kind of unnecessary risk situation to keep their career, their development, and their learning front and center. So, you know, for us, I would say it's been a lot of time investment on, you know, new virtual platforms, new partners that are maybe a little bit ahead of the game when it comes to virtual learning and development. Um, the other thing that I would say is that we have really been, um, you know, trying to remind our leaders at a time where I'm sure like many other organizations, our budget and our forecasting and what we spend um, from an SG&A perspective is um, being looked at very critically and much more frequently. So, person back there, sorry about that. Um, so we are, um, I would say just from a sheer, um, a budget perspective, really trying to remind leaders, um, you know, one of my big lessons learned from the recession of 08 and 09 was that there were many organizations that cut really deep and really quick on learning and development. It's one of the easiest things to cut. It's not related to your product. It's not related to something maybe tangible that you see right away. The impact of that for many organizations was that their pipeline was, was thin and was limited for years to come because they cut so quick and so deep on that development. So what we're really trying to remind our, our, our leaders of right now is now is not the time to start just cutting all SGNA related to learning. In fact, now more than ever, it's really important that we're engaging people more and differently. So we will do our best to come up with low cost solutions. We will do our best as, as the learning leaders, as the HR leaders to come up with ways that you can you know, kind of meet your business needs, hit your budget, but at the same time, engage your people. Um, but when you're looking for those items to kind of shore back on, don't go there first. Let's look at some of the other, maybe non essentials, but looking at learning and development as a non-essential business expense is, I think, really short-sighted. So we are spending a lot of time in that vein of just really educating our leaders to make sure that they understand, much like, you know, we wouldn't just, you know, stop buying parts for key components we need to produce something on the line. Um, we can't stop, you know, putting pieces and dollars into our, you know, our most critical asset, which is our people. So I would say we're spending a lot of time on that more informal education as well to make sure everybody's really understanding those pieces. So, uh, you know, it's it's all about overhauling. I would say our for, our, our full learning uh, capability and also informally doing a lot of mentoring um, and a lot of touch base, um, especially just you know as we look across the businesses that have been impacted even more so maybe based on either their geography, such as some of our, our businesses in Italy that have literally had doors shuttered for a couple of months. 
um, or just businesses that have been hit particularly hard, like some of those in our automotive industry. A lot of people are not going out and spending a lot of money buying big purchases mm -hmm. for new, like vehicles. So that, those are just a couple things I would add to them. Well, Amanda, thank you so much. And I know from the uh, <clears throat> practitioner base that will be listening to this recording, um, one of the key takeaways that I'm sure a majority of people are going to really resonate with is the fact that we have to maintain the investments and try to sell the story of why investments around learning and development and your people are so critical, right? Because there is that old adage, you know, one of the first things to go is, but you're taking a very, very strong perspective of educating your leadership as to why that's maybe not necessarily the best path. So thank you for sharing that. Sure. Monica. Modifications from your perspectives to formal and informal. Oh, yeah. formal, formal and informal learning um, will undergo and already are significant uh, shifts. As far as informal learning, um, since March, uh, many people, um, I, I said, we really now need a network of leaders. You, uh, you need people to do things that they have not done before. Um, like research on a on a topic or a subject because we're doing we're we're operating in in areas that are brand new. Um, when we looked at um, needing to um, reduce workforces or or change them across the country with different um, COVID nineteen related um, city and state or, um, ordinances and um, directives impacting our operations, we had to find out do we for work share in that state is it available um what is and we have different platforms different needs um and 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 it's not like you can just wait on legal to research that for you learning um has to happen right now and you have to know how to learn how to ask questions how to research and source for information quickly and then we needed people to share what they learned in real time with other decision makers in the company that need to make decisions as well. So rapid learning and deployment of what you're learning in real time, and then um, potentially sending that up to higher levels to say, here's my plan, here's my findings, recommendations, and, and getting the green light. Because again, you still got to have organizational cadence and accountability as you learn, adopt, execute on different priorities but you still got to have that accountability and alignment. Um, and so on the informal learning, um, it's rapid and ongoing, and that's exciting to me. But there's still formal learning that continues to go forward and is very necessary. And it's a blended approach for us. Definitely, um, as I said, we have some new things to address, so we've had to create completely new content, um, but a lot of it is curating existing um, content repurposing things that we have. Um, when we talked about soft skills, the prioritization of leadership skills changing a bit, we have training and, 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 and information and resources on some of these skills, but it wasn't the highest priority for some that it is now. And so we've moved those things, dusted them off. Um, we're giving them to groups like frontline supervisors, just targeted audiences that need certain learning. We're absolutely leveraging our external partners like DeVry um, for professional development on an ongoing basis. And, and because we've always done that, that is a sense of normalcy for our workforce. These um, web-enabled learning um, webinars that were structured, communicated, those, they stayed on schedule, on track, not disrupted by this. That is a, a benefit and a plus. And at the same time, we can say, hey, partner, what do you have on this, that, the other? Because now we have some new conditions to address um, with, within the workforce and some new learning that's needed. Um, and so it's this blended approach um, to learning, um, especially our, our formal learning uh, and reprioritizing it, uh, what the content is and how we deliver it. And it's, and it's very different. So we'll have these, of course, web-enabled um, training uh, and discussions but we also are forming um, new teams. We have um, a COVID-19 task force across the company. When you're trying to, to give clear direction, I think it was um, Lori that said, so there's gotta be a single source of truth, right on. Um, that task force was formed in March quickly and every employee 
can send a question to that task force. You don't have to go through your leader, through your HR, et cetera, because we're distributed workforce now. And we need everybody informed, everybody on point, um, everyone knowing how to get information to the level of directives. So that became our single source of truth for a lot of direction, a lot of um, new, you know, learning, development, key things that we needed everyone to know, protocols. They go in that single source, shared document. Um, we're using cloud-enabled tools that everybody can reach wherever they are from their cell phones or their desktop, et cetera. Um, we are using those things to, to push learning. That is um, things you need to know and execute on right now. And of course, the skill building and development that is for um, you know now and into the future. So all, all of that is happening. Excellent. So Monica, I'm hearing, and Lori, I'm hearing single source of truth. So individuals mm. know where to go and then information gets filtered out and then dynamic execution, right? To meet Absolutely. the needs of different individuals, different times, different purposes. Different so time it, zones, yes. So it's a very multifaceted approach to the way RRD and, and all of us are looking at it. Mm -hmm. um, we'd love to hear from your perspective on, the, on this part. Sure, very, very similar to everybody who's already spoken. We have a lot of the same uh, challenges and, and some of the same plans. But one thing that we're also considering is, you know, with, with all the tools that are out there, I think, you know, uh, ever since the, uh, the, the, the announcements were made that we're going to be working more uh, from home, working remotely, uh, all this new technology has now surfaced, or at least if it was out there, it wasn't as obvious that it was out there, right? Mm -hmm. We're probably pushing them away on, on all those uh, emails, trying to, to set up time with us. <laughs> but uh, but now we're really taking advantage of those tools and, and understanding how it can benefit every single one of us. I mean, we have uh, we have a lot of challenges. We 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 have colleagues, employees across both the U.S. and Canada, and so there's a lot of differences in how each audience member receives information. Mm -hmm. It's important to make it easy for them, right? It's challenging enough as it is now, so we are uh, kind of focused a little bit also on the, those technologies. So uh, using non-traditional uh, tools to teach the traditional training, the formal and, and informal. Um, there's a lot of opportunities also putting it in the hands of the, of the field teams. Uh, you know, a lot of the challenges we have today are, they're used to hip to hip training. So how do we, how do, we do hip to hip training? You know, we can't do it anymore, it's what I hear. And so I, you know, the first question we ask, well, I mean, we have the challenges that we have. How would you do it? How could we do it? How should we do it? And so we answer those questions. We help them with the technology to answer those questions. So to those skill sets that I think Monica even mentioned that weren't as critical before, they are way critical now. Mm -hmm. uh, we have probably done more training on all of those virtual tools um, for regular day-to-day -day operations than we have to set somebody up for a trained trainer. Mm -hmm. Um, also, the reskilling and upskilling really of our LD team has been a key for us. Um, you know, we are traditionally a, an LD department. We have our facilitators and we have our designers. Uh, but that, that has to be kind of turned upside down right now because, you know, for uh, a couple of weeks out of every month, the focus will be in design. And then the last couple of weeks of that same month, it'll be in delivery. So, and we don't have, you know, the workforce to support it in that way. Uh, similar to the business plans and the, and the IT plans shrinking, so do our plans. Our, our, our model for development has also changed. So we now need to upskill our talent to help ensure that anybody on the team can help with that process and jump in to design when design needs to be done and deliver when delivery needs to be done. So there also has to be a change in that traditional way of thinking of a setup of an L and D department. Um, my my team hears it all the time. Flex, you know, that's flex. Where can we flex it? And so the idea is to take any project and at any point anybody can pick it up, run with it, and if it's uh, somebody else's turn for a while, they can just pick it up and keep running with the ball. Um, so so that's really important, especially to the agility that we are now expected to use. You know, when you have a team that can do any any of that, that kind of the full desk and uh, able to pick up and go, you're going to be able to keep up with the business demands and it's going to make everybody else on the team 
uh, not just from from a L and D perspective, mm -hmm. uh, happy and comfortable and able to keep up, but also from the business perspective, you know, kind of adding back to that value that you know, not not taking that deep cut in in, in the HR world. You know, the value that we can offer is helping the business mm -hmm. kind of continue to succeed. So it's not just um, developing training for the soft skills, but also developing training to generate the business, generate sales, and get us back uh, where we need to be and, and make up for some of that lost ground. But again, just focusing on the L&D team as well is, is my big push uh, at this time as well to ensure that um, they're flexible, they can do any part of the process, and they're always showing value to the business. Thank you very, very much for that. So one of the things I hear is flex, right? Flex, be adaptive, agile, um, play more than one role. You know, when is when when is the time that we need to change when we're forced to change, right? So today has been an extremely eye-opening discussion with so many different themes that we've kicked around. Um, one of the key things I hear is agility. I hear humility. I hear commitment to personal engagement, talking about the person and then the product comes after. Trust, action, speed to market, efficiency, all of these major topics. So one thank you to Amanda and Lori and Monica and Pete for taking some time out of your, I'm sure, crazy schedule um, to, to do this. Um, most importantly, also, thank you to those that are watching us taking time out to learn how other great practitioners are collaborating amongst themselves and us to try and figure out our way into the new normal. So for those of you that are watching and weren't able to participate live, um, please know that your DeVry representative will be reaching out to you for your reactions on today's discussion. Also to find out if there's any other topics that you'd like to hear in the future, maybe you'd like to be a panelist in the future as well and also any questions that you might have, they'll be able to respond. So again, another very, very warm and thank, a uh, very warm thank you to each of us that have shared information today. Um, and everybody, here's to your success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.